Hello everyone and welcome to True Crime Shorts. The video I have today won't be very short, but the case is just way too gruesome and thorough for me to skip it down. Today we'll be discussing the unsolved case of Mr. Cruel, also known as the Australian Boogeyman. This case is one of the most disturbing cases I have ever witnessed, so buckle up. At around 4 a.m. on the 22nd of August, 1987, in the suburban area of Lower Plenty in Melbourne, Australia, a masked man was lurking around the family home. He was able to enter the home through the living room window without alerting anyone. He then made his way to the parents' bedroom with a knife and a gun in his possession. Pretending to be a regular thief out for money, he woke both parents up. The parents were then forced to lay belly down on the bed where the criminal would tie the hands and the feet of the parents together, preventing any possible escape from happening. He then proceeded to blindfold and gag the parents with surgical tape and move them into a nearby wardrobe. He then gagged and blindfolded the parents' six-year-old son with surgical tape and tied him to his own bed. The intruder then proceeded to make his way into the bedroom of the family's 11-year-old daughter. Over the course of two hours, the masked criminal would brutally rape the 11-year-old girl, taking multiple breaks throughout to wander the home and at one point even stopping to make himself a meal. After sexually assaulting the little girl, the masked man left the house taking a box of records and a jacket with him. This event would mark the start of Mr. Cruel, an Australian masked psychopath that would continue to haunt Australian families for decades. Upon arrival at the scene, police concluded that a box of records and a jacket had been stolen. Furthermore, the 11-year-old victim claimed that the intruder used the family phone to make a threatening call, even using the word bozo during one of the breaks that the man had took while raping the 11-year-old girl. It was then concluded that no call had been placed during that time. Later on, it will become clear that this was a trend of Mr. Cruel, planting objects like this to confuse the investigators. The investigation would soon reach a dead end due to lack of evidence. It would take Mr. Cruel over a year to commit his second crime. On the 27th of December, 1988, John Wills, his wife and four daughters were still enjoying the post-holiday bliss in their Ringwood area home, only a few miles away from the previous assault. At around 5.45 a.m., John Wills would be woken up by the feeling of an object placed on his forehead. Upon waking up, John realized that a man with dark blue overalls and a blue ski mask was holding a gun to his head. The man whispered, quote unquote, don't be a hero, and again, acting like a thief out for money. After tying John and his wife up the exact same way as the assault a year prior, they were also bound and gagged with surgical tape, just like last time. The man stole 35 Australian dollars from their bedside table and proceeded to cut the house's phone lines. With this head start, Mr. Cruel would make his way into the shared bedroom of the Wills' family's four daughters. Addressing the eldest daughter, Sharon Wills, by her name, he brutally gagged and blindfolded the little girl like he did to her parents. He took a few pieces of her clothing and abducted her, leaving in the early morning. John Wills would break from his restraint shortly after, waking up his neighbors to call the police as the family home's phone lines had been cut. His daughter had been taken and the Wills family had to deal with the trauma of not knowing where their daughter was until 18 hours after the abduction at around midnight. Sharon Wills had been found standing on a street corner by a passerby wrapped in green garbage bags. My name is Sharon Wills and I was taken from home early this morning. A man left me here and told me to go ring home, she told the passerby. Sharon Wills had been blindfolded the entire time and was cleaned thoroughly for forensic evidence before being dropped off a few miles from her home. While the Wills family were happy to be reunited again, the investigators were it. It became clear that this was the same man who committed the assault a year earlier. But yet again, no evidence has been found. The investigators would hide this from the press, 
it was clear that an environment of terror was being formed. Yet another case unsolved, with absolutely no evidence, the investigators were asking themselves who would be next. Their question would be answered nearly two years later, on July 3rd, 1990. In the area of Canterbury, Victoria, just outside of Melbourne, a family of well-off English citizens had been renting a house in a prestigious neighbourhood, sharing a street with many Australian politicians and public officials. The Linus family moved to Canterbury for business purposes and was about to move back to England just days after. Brian and Rosemary Linus were attending a farewell party thrown for them, leaving their daughters Fiona and Nicola Linus home alone for a few hours. Shortly before midnight that day, the two teenage girls were woken up by a masked intruder. He forced 13-year-old Nicola into another room to collect her school uniform, while tying 15-year-old Fiona to her own bed. Before kidnapping Nicola with the family's rental car, Mr. Cruel told Fiona to let her father, Brian, know that he will give Nicola back after a ransom of 25,000 Australian dollars has been paid. No more than 20 minutes after the abduction, Brian and Rosemary Linus came home to an empty driveway and one of their daughters missing, with the other tied to the bed, traumatized. Police on the scene found, yet again, no evidence. Unlike the abduction of Sharon Wills, Nicola was not returned shortly after being kidnapped. Neither was there a way to pay the ransom of 25,000 Australian dollars as Mr. Cruel hasn't given any instructions for payment in the message he left Fiona. Thankfully, Nicola was found 50 hours after her abduction outside of an electricity station. It was her 14th birthday. Like the abduction of Sharon Wills, Nicola had been thoroughly cleaned and bathed to remove any forensic evidence from the sexual assault he had committed to the child. Throughout the whole duration of her captivity, Nicola had been forced into a neck brace attached to Mr. Cruel's bed. No more than a year later, Mr. Cruel would strike again. John and Phyllis Chan were hard-working immigrants to Australia, running multiple restaurants and both often working until midnight. They would leave their eldest daughter, 13-year-old Carmen, in charge of her two younger sisters. At this point, it was already concluded that Mr. Cruel would study their victims for weeks, even months, before initiating an attack. On a regular Saturday night on April 13, 1991, John and Phyllis Chan were very busy with managing their multiple restaurants, as is usual on the Saturdays. Carmen and her sisters were watching TV in a room. At around 8.40 p.m., they wanted to have dinner and proceeded to go to the kitchen. Upon arriving, they were confronted by Mr. Cruel, wearing a balaclava and a green-gray tracksuit armed with a knife. I only want your money, Mr. Cruel stated, asking Carmen to show him where the money was, before forcing Carmen's younger sisters into Carmen's closet, moving a bed in front of the closet to create a makeshift prison. It took only minutes for Carmen's younger sisters to break out of the closet and call their father. As police arrived to the scene, they were able to trace Carmen's whereabouts for 300 meters using sniffer dogs before concluding that they entered a getaway car. They also saw, quote unquote, pay back Asian drug dealer, more, more to come, end quote, written on John's car in the driveway. After thorough investigation into John Chan's business and past, it was concluded that this was, again, a trick to confuse investigators. No concluding evidence had been found on the scene. Jack and Phyllis Chan were waiting months in traumatizing pain, not knowing if their daughter was safe or even if she was alive or not. Nearly a year later, on April 9, 1992, a man was walking his dog before stumbling upon an odd object. After bending down to touch it, the man was horrified and called the police. The police arrived to a fully decomposed skeleton soon revealed to be Carmen Chan. An autopsy revealed that after being raped and assaulted, she had been shot three times in the head. It was also later revealed that she had likely been dead for close to a year. Although Mr. Cruel has never been caught, 
the task force arrested over 70 people involved in the trade of child pornography, a hideous underworld that many believe Mr. Cruel was involved in. Both surviving victims of Mr. Cruel claimed to see or hear hints of a camera attached to the bed that they had been braced to, leading many investigators to believe that Mr. Cruel was involved in the trade of child pornography. While authorities believe that Carmen Chan was Mr. Cruel's last offense, there are almost a dozen sexual assaults on children in the Victoria area, all of them sharing a couple of details with the known Mr. Cruel abductions. As of this moment, the Mr. Cruel case has been reopened since 2010, and he remains one of Australia's most horrific and wanted criminals. Thank you so much for watching. I want to apologize for the terrible microphone quality. I hope that the video was good enough to make up for it. I'm currently a very broke college student, but I'm planning on getting one very, very soon. This channel is also very new, so any feedback, good or bad, love or hate, will be greatly appreciated and motivating. Thank you again, and until next time.